Hey. All right, let's go. Worth it. Bow chicka bow wow. So, this moment right here encapsulates almost every single problem I have with this season. Red vs. Blue Zero, what can I say about this show? Well, for starters, after Season 17 of Red vs. Blue, I say that uh, Rooster Teeth needed to change characters. The Reds and Blues we've been watching since the start have run their course, and it was clear that the writers were having problems making new stories to run them through. They ended with a pretty good story, letting the cast save the world one last time. However, when Season 17 ended, we didn't know that we were getting a mostly new cast in the following season. Zero, as I will call it from here on, was at first a breath of fresh air, bringing in new possibilities and a new generation. As after 17 seasons, people would naturally want to move on to other projects and end up with different responsibilities in the company if they didn't outright leave Rooster Teeth. When Zero came out, I was really excited to see where the show would go because despite having problems with seasons 15 through 17, I did enjoy most of my time, especially with season 17. All this is really important to say that I went to Zero really wanting to like it and a lot of people did too. I read through the comments of the episodes and they, when they first came out, and for the first few episodes, people were positive and wanted to see where things were going. And then the fourth episode came out and people started turning on the show. Then the fifth episode came out and the problems became really obvious. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a step back and really take a look at Red vs. Blue Zero. To start, let's talk about what I actually like about the season because it's not a very long list. For one, the animation is the best Red vs. Blue has had since Mighty Owen passed away back in 2015. Second, the voice acting is amazing. All the new VAs are really giving their roles their all, and I do commend them for that. They did a fantastic job, especially because I don't think they had a the good direction. Finally, while not the music I particularly enjoy, and I would never listen to it by choice, the music in Zero is super energetic and really great, especially for the more action-focused narrative. It's just not my genre. So with all the good things I have to say about this show done, let's get into everything else, and the best way to do that is to just dive directly into the first episode. Why? I'm just saying, anyways, it's cold out here. And really dark. This season begins with exposition about Washington getting his brain damage fixed. Heard they fixed that a long time ago using cutting-edge robotics and old kitchen appliances. He's got superpowers now. 30 seconds into the season and we have our first major problem. For those who didn't see seasons 15 through 17 or just need a refresher, at the end of season 15, Washington was shot in the throat after being trapped in his armor for several days without food and water. He then suffered brain damage from oxygen deprivation and would start blacking out forgetting where he was and what he was doing. In season 16, the Reds and Blues end up uh, with time guns and travel through time until they decide to stop Wash from getting shot in the neck. This fractures the timeline and nearly unravels the universe itself. So the Reds and Blues must go back through all the events of the series as the main villain is trying to break the timeline more, and relive all past events exactly as they were. All this culminates in Washington making the ultimate sacrifice where they must let him get shot one more time and fix the original paradox they created. Hey guys, I don't want to be alone. Will you, uh, can you all be there with me? So when Washington just appears in the following season with a throwaway line about him being fixed, it comes across as a disservice to the character that gave up everything to save his friends and the rest of the universe. Now Washington's sacrifice that was built up for three seasons means nothing. Now that's looking past Washington not liking people running around his brain after having an AI as a freelancer, but the cherry on top is that this exposition about Wash is all for a joke. He's got superpowers now. Something more practical, like knowing seconds before a microwave is set to beep. Now the reason why Washington and Carolina are here is because they were hired by, I'm going with a paramilitary by the name of Alliance of Defense, or AOD, and they were transporting alien artifacts, the reason why never discussed in the season. There are some context clues, likely they were just being studied, at which point you wouldn't need military transport on this scale. Or they're trying to keep the artifacts out of dangerous hands like the main villain Zero, who is presumed dead after being shot and falling off a cliff. Now, after transporting the artifacts into the military base, two of our villains attack, and why they waited uh, until the transport was almost complete instead of, I don't know, attacking when they were on the road with far less than a fully stocked military base, I will never know. I'm just saying, the villains are lucky they have more plot armor than the good guys, and by good guys, I mean Carolina. 
I mean, Diesel is a terrible killer. He can barely kill people into combat armor, which is obvious that one of the people he harms the most can still scream after his last attack. FaZe, however, is a different story. She at least stabs people with her magical blood-absorbing knife. Also, she can teleport, and Ende is my favorite of the villains. Unlike Diesel, whose character traits include psychotic laughing and hitting things, FaZe is sarcastic and has a fun moveset being able to teleport to wherever she throws her knife, regardless of the distance. I love speed characters, and the way FaZe moves is icing on the very burnt cake. So, Wash and Carolina get involved, and yes, when the real characters are fighting, it is a well choreographed and a lot of fun. Partway into the fight, we meet Zero, the leader of the villains, uh, though he remains unnamed at the time, and then we cut to Shatter Squad. We're introduced to them with a race. We have the leader one, the planner Axel, the fast one East, and the tech guy Raymond. Now, the way this first scene is written tells me that one and East have a friendly rivalry. They don't any other time it's brought up, and it's far more hostile. Axel is made out to be the voice of reason, but he does pretty much nothing. The only reason I even remember his name is, well... Sorry, boss. No one axes Axel. Got it memorized? <laughs> one, however, is a bullheaded one that can never seem to work together with anyone. This is a character trait that we are told about her, and I will get into it in a minute. But the first episode establishes that she's a show-off. Raymond, I guess, is supposed to be the straight man to the rest of the team. He's also supposed to be the tech guy, but doesn't know what a phone brick is called. I don't have that end thingy. The butt. But what do you guys call it? I call it a butt. East, however, is the one with the most character. She has daddy issues, and her dad is Commander West. After being introduced to Shatter Squad, we jump back to the military base uh, where the villains steal the artifacts and Carolina passes out. Also, Washington is interrogated over a temple, and we're told that they are collecting keys to it, which are the artifacts. I'm gonna make this one quick. We've been introduced to the keys before, Tucker's been tied to one for several seasons, and they introduce more in later seasons. I'll return to this later, but I stopped to say that returning fans already know this, even though this season uses other things other than energy swords as a key, and new fans don't need that much exposition this early. All Diesel needed to say was that he knows their keys. Anyway, Washington is interrogated and left dead. He does nothing else for the rest of the season. I don't want to be here all day, so I'll say that Washington uh, would have died before telling them what they wanted to know, as he knows what the temples can do. And they could have replaced uh, Washington with literally anyone, and the season would have been better off. I love Washington's character, but he should have been retired after his self-sacrifice. So Carolina wakes up sometime later after Shatter Squad shows up, and they try and have Raymond be our season's comic relief. It fails miserably. Carolina takes a look at Shadow Squad's files, and we get more into their characters. Axel is a weapons expert and has a family. Also, he was a Boy Scout. None of this, to my knowledge, outside of his family ever comes up again. West is the team's leader, also East's father. East is fast, competitive, and has daddy issues. One is impulsive and has problems working with others. Finally, Raymond is a tech guy. Again, he doesn't know what a phone book is called. I guess it's supposed to be a joke, but it's not funny and it is a detriment to the character have that end thingy. The butt. Well, what do you guys call it? I call it a butt. So, with the character introduction over with, I have to say, exposition is not how you introduce your main characters. It can be done, but you have to have real skill to make it not feel forced. Episode 1 did an okay job in showing up one in East's competitive natures, and one's need to show off. Instead of telling us their traits, we could have seen them as they entered the AOD facility and witnessed how dysfunctional they are as a team. So, we meet the mechanic Tiny. I don't like Tiny. Moving on. We also get a character development about Axel. Apparently he annoys East at least a little bit when he brings up the Millennium Falcon. Except, in this series, it's a lawnmower. You know, if he was the idea of the normal American dad and also the leader, Axel might be far more interesting. Think a more socially conscious Hank Hill. Anyway, we get to see a conversation between uh, one and Carolina about why she one is on Shatter Squad, and we learn that she wants to be strong, and after that, Shatter Squad minus Raymond and Wes start training. They don't really work together, but they also don't get in each other's way. And this is the problem of how they decide to introduce the team. They got the job done quick and effectively, however, because they aren't getting in each other's ways, their team in conflict can't be built up properly, so the competitive nature between one and east is partially lost. Axel goes to, to speak to Carolina, and we cut to Zero and Face. Nothing really happens, and then we cut to Raymond and Wes investigating what happened. We're then told to East's backstory. She was dying, then given to Starlight Labs. They experimented on her, and now she has super speed, but it weakens her. 
We're then told one's backstory. Her parents are dead, Axel is her adopted father. You would never guess that they have a father-daughter relationship because they have no chemistry between each other. And I honestly miss that one's parents were dead the first time through, so when I say her backstory has no bearing on the plot, I mean it. East and West backstory does, they build it up to pay it off in the last few episodes. Now that I think about it, it might have been planned that Zero was uh, one's father and Axel was the one that uh, was supposed to kill him, which is why he adopted her. So, we see Zero and Faze fighting Temple Guardians at the temple we saw earlier while One and East train together. One and East criticize each other while Zero and Faze work in tandem. This would be great foreshadowing to draw parallels between our villains and main cast, except One and East are fighting perfectly in tandem as well. They aren't screwing each other up, which is what their dialogue is telling me. Also, Zero can teleport, which makes FaZe's abilities far less special considering FaZe doesn't need technology to do so. Now that I know everyone can teleport, why doesn't everyone have teleportation? Axel asks Carolina who they're fighting, and she doesn't know. So after training, Carolina fights one in East together. In the following episode, we see Zero and FaZe uh, fight another Guardian. We also get to see the Carolina vs. Shadow Squad fight as a cut between the two, and this is where the writing of the character traits falls apart very quickly. Remember, one is a character that, uh, can't work well on teams. However, they finally get a shot at Carolina, and it isn't uh, one that runs ahead first into battle. It's East that abandons the team dynamic to fight alone. Also, Zero and FaZe uh, kill the Guardian, and Zero gets a powerful magical sword. Back with Strider Squad, we see one reach out to help East up in a friendly gesture between teammates, and East deny her. Almost as if East is the one with the problem working on teams with people. I legitimately think that someone screwed up on the writing team and assigned uh, one of East's traits to one, and no one realized it. So, one and East get into a fight about why they lost, and East goes off on her own. We also see the side effects of her power being some form of seizure. At the same time, Raymond and West track down Washington in the base. Also, Diesel is there. I assume he got lost on his way out, uh, and while Raymond moves, watch uh, West to Fist fights Diesel until Raymond comes back with a rocket launcher. We also get a tiny bit from Zero and FaZe talking about an Echo and her father. Carolina goes to talk to East who blows her off. We also get East and West interacting. East is incredibly hostile to West because he willingly gave her away when she was younger to people who experimented on her, which is why she resents him. Shadow Squad gets a new car and meets up at where they're told what Raymond and West found. They head off to find the villains and Axel meets Zero, who he has a pass away. At one point, Zero was part of the AOD, then went AWOL and Axel shot Zero, sending him off a cliff. The following episode starts with the most uncanny animation of the show, and I'm including the past 17 seasons because for some reason, for the first half of the episode, they overanimate Shadow Squad while they're talking about their failed mission. I can't remember where, but I've heard people equate this weird looking animation to the way Power Rangers move while in their suits, and now I can't unsee it. I get it, Red vs. Blue has a huge disadvantage in how the characters can come across. The three most important things to have tone come across is body language, how someone speaks, specifically the tone they're using, and facial inflections. Facial inflections being the most important part. Every character in Zero wears a mask, which means the only way they can get the right emotions across is the way the VAs deliver their lines and how the episode is animated. It can be difficult for people to get the proper tone across. The problem is, the lines and the animation is so far over the top that it creates this narrative dissonance between the scene and the rest of the show. The rest of the series is well directed and mostly well animated, but we'll get to that very soon. Anyway, during the fight between Shadow Squad and Viper Squad, yes, it did take me four episodes to remember Zero's team name, they end up fighting each other where West gets severely hurt due to a karate chop to the back of the head. I just want to say that SpongeBob was hit harder in the episode The Bully. Okay, I'm ready. The rest of Shadow Squad gets hit harder than West in this fight. I mean, how durable is his armor? A wet piece of paper and a windstorm would last longer in a fight. I will say the fight uh, between the two teams is probably the best in the season. I just love the way East and Fates fight each other. I mean, I don't care about any of these characters, so I'm less unsatisfied at the end, but it's very nice animation. We're given this some semblance of insight into East that she cares about her dad and doesn't just hate him. And Zero's at least given a little bit of a snarky personality while he fights Shadow Squad. Also, you may be wondering why Zero doesn't just kill Shadow Squad despite being more than a match for all four of them and their leader combined. Well, you see... The AOD is trying to make one into another Zero because they're afraid of Zero because... Zero wanted to prove that he's the strongest. Zero didn't kill him because he wanted to prove that he's the strongest by not killing the only people with any semblance of a chance to stand in his way. You know, I very rarely think about it, but the villain wipes out the heroes only to walk away while they're weak is one of the dumbest and worst cliches that anyone can use, because all it does is show how incompetent the villain and the heroes are. The villain won't use their best chance to get rid of their one obstacle, and the heroes keep losing to this person too stupid to kill them. 
Either they're needed in the story by the villain so he won't kill them, or something stops him so he can't kill them. Oddly enough, I don't need to go far to get an example. Take a look at the Chorus Trilogy. Felix and Locust didn't kill the Reds and Blues because they needed them to help fuel a civil war because they were trying to genocide a planet. When they were found out, the only reason they escaped was because of Carolina and Church stepping in to save them. Zero should have killed them. There was no reason not to. Anyway, at the end of the episode, we get teased for the next one, the worst episode of the season. I want to stop and say that episode 4 is where people really started turning on the show. So far, we have brought back two characters. Carolina, which while ultimately I wish didn't come back, made sense. She was brought back to be a tie to the original characters to keep people who might not have come back with the new cast. Washington was not handled well. I was pretty positive on my first watch through even though I wasn't a fan of Washington back from the start. I started growing very annoyed very quickly at the end of episode 4. They announced Tucker was coming back and we know that Zero wants his energy sword that also acts as an alien key to temples. And if you know anything about Red vs Blue lore, you know the only way they can use that key is by killing Tucker because he won't help them and the key is tied to Tucker for life. So a fan favorite character is coming back just to die. That knowledge is how we end episode 4. Also, they screwed up royally because you can't just bring back characters that fast, that easily. Bring back a character, especially a loved one, is usually supposed to be an events episode. The episode where fans go, I can't believe they brought back Tucker, this episode is going to be awesome! It shouldn't fill you with dread. The writing was not the best, which was evident from the start. People gave it a few episodes. It's a brand new cast, so there was going to be some growing pains. It happened. But when Tucker was announced halfway through the season, it felt more like they were going, we have four episodes before people realize we aren't telling a decent story. Let's bring in someone uh, to get them to continue tuning in. Now, I don't think that's what they were doing. I think the writing was just unpolished and they didn't go through as many rewrites of the story as they should have. But they didn't, and this is where Zero started becoming, well, hated. I'm going to stand by that Episode 5 Sideways is the worst episode of Red vs. Blue Zero. Like, if the rest of the series is passable, if you haven't seen most of the other seasons, Episode 5 is still bad. Let's not even start with Tucker, let's go more technical. The animation in this episode, for most of the episode, is sluggish. It's hard to explain, at first I thought it was a rendering error. It happens, it's a problem, but sometimes an error pops up and you need to re-render. I thought that some error caused the episode to play at a lower frame rate. The rest of the series feels super fluid as if it's playing at 60 FPS or higher. My monitor caps at 60. This episode, however, feels like it's playing uh, back at, at like 40. Just enough that it's noticeable during the action scenes. In truth, what I think happened is they had a shorter episode, so they decreased the speed ever so slightly that you can't really tell because no one sounds super off when they speak. But to show what I mean, here's a few seconds at a normal speed followed up by a sped up version. Doesn't it flow better and lose all the sluggishness of the episode? And that's only 10% faster. Anyway, let's go ahead and talk about the other problems. Tucker. Outside of the animation and writing problems that have been constant throughout this season, Tucker is the problem with the episode. Tucker has always been a somewhat uh, self-centered, womanizing character. He joined the military to get laid. When the Blues got a tank, he wanted to pick up women in said tank. However, in the course trilogy, Tucker was forced to step up and grow beyond his original character traits, growing into an actual hero and leader due to the absence of a church at Carolina and Washington, as they were separated for a portion of Season 12. Yes, he took a step back in Season 15 to his earlier characterization, which was still a problem, but here, all Tucker's uh, character is self-centered jerk trying to use his hero status from previous seasons to... Why is he here? Tucker's supposed to be training new recruits, I guess, but they never tell us that. This episode just starts with him giving a speech about how amazing he is. At first, you think it's so he can get laid, but the only person who interacts with him is this female soldier he's incredibly rude to, and not in a way that any other version of Tucker would act like if he was trying to get laid. And then they turn around and drag in the Shatter Squad to tell Tucker he's in danger, only for Tucker to ask, Who's Viper? But, like, who are they? A great question. Who is Viper Squad? Well, they're evil. The problem is, only one of the villains is fleshed out enough, that being FaZe, who we will get to soon. The other ones, Zero and Diesel, have nothing going for them. Diesel could re be replaced by a well-aimed brick and nothing would change. His only character traits are that he's strong and stupid. That's it. Zero gets to be snarky sometimes, but that's all we get. We know little to nothing about the male villains. 
Zero worked with the AOD, but left because he felt betrayed. And he wanted ultimate power to prove that he's the strongest. That's all we really know about him. He has no real motivation. Uh, everything we know is a contradiction. The AOD made him this way. Maybe. Now they're trying to make a new Zero with One. Maybe! We don't actually know if One is the new Zero because we don't know why they were afraid of Zero. For all we know, they weren't and he's just some AWOL soldier that uh, stole a suit of armor that they want back. All we really know about Zero is he has a past with Axel and he wants ultimate power. I'm not even one who needs well thought out motivation. You can have a villain that's evil because they want to be evil, but you can't allude to these higher motivations while also not telling us anything about the characters for the entire season. We need something to latch on to. The meta wanted the AI units because he was corrupted by his AI. His mind was warped into this power hungry monster that wanted all the strength he could get from the AI fragment led by a rogue AI that wanted to recreate the Alpha. Meta is Zero done right. We learn about his past as Freelancer main, see what led him into the meta, and it all feels far more natural because they took time to show us what happened during Project Freelancer. Yes, the meta was in Season 6 and we didn't see him getting shot in the throat to the reason why he needed the AI that corrupted him until Season 9. But he had the AI, Washington, and enough interesting storylines to hold us over. Zero has only three storylines. The main one, Carolina wanting revenge for Washington, and East and West story, which is the only good one this season. No time is dedicated to Carolina Z to build it up properly. And Zero has been riddled with everything we've talked about so far, along with things we haven't gotten to yet. And now we get to the scene. Hey. Ugh. All right, let's go. Worth it. Bow -bow -bow. This sums up almost all the problems I have with this show for a few reasons. First, it's just not funny. Tucker's catchphrase is iconic. Normally, he pulls out his catchphrase when something mildly sexual is stated. It's an endpoint to a joke, a period if you may, that works best out of context of the statements another character is saying. For example, If we set up a hard line, yeah. Church, wait! Huh? I just wanted to say, I got a hard line Tex can use. Here, it's proven that the writers don't know how to write Tucker's most used joke. Here, Tucker just places his hand on East, gets punched in the gut, and he says, Worth it, bow chicka bow wow. The reason why it doesn't work here is because the phrase had no setup. The punchline and joke was Tucker getting hit. Quite simply put, this punchline here doesn't fall in line with any other Tucker catcher of phrase gag. In any other season, the joke would go more like this. We'll say, instead of East glitching, she says something like, It's getting hot here, we need to move before it's too late. Tucker responds with, Babe, it's always hot when I'm around. Bow chicka bow wow. Then he gets hit and says, Worth it. Now, was that funnier? Maybe, maybe not. But it's far more in line with how Tucker normally is written. Alright, screw it. You guys get behind me and stay tight. Bow chicka bow wow. Never mind. Tucker's in front. Eh, it was worth it. Next, Tucker's dialogue in this episode is bad. There's not a better word for it. The dialogue is just poorly written and it doesn't matter who's saying it. I mean, no, 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 it's not Chris, my first name is Lavernia's, is the first line of the episode. I would say that new fans don't need to know this and returning fans already know this, but new fans already know this. The fourth episode name dropped to Lavernius Tucker at the end of the episode. We have to save Lavernius Tucker. Tucker, also for some reason, was directed horribly. I don't know if it's just the lack of the voice that filter or if his F actor wasn't paid enough, but every line sounds like a first take and uh, as if Jason just didn't try. And I wouldn't blame him if he didn't. I wouldn't have either. Tugger's dialogue isn't just filler, it's also redundant. And what's worse is that in this episode Tugger does nothing. They don't let him fight. He tries to, but no, it's too risky. Tucker's smart, he can outthink freelancers, and he's been able to organize his friends to take out foes he couldn't possibly defeat on his own. Yes, he's not a great fighter, but he can pull a trigger and hold his own at least for a short time. Could he beat Zero one-on-one? -on -one? Probably not. But the new characters have plot armor until they need to be killed off. The episode is infuriating because Tucker has fought battles that he couldn't have possibly won. Case in point, the most popular episode of Red vs. Blue, the fight between Tex, the Reds, and Tucker. Anyway, we get Carolina asking Axel about what he knows uh, about Zero, who doesn't tell her anything that we don't already know. Also, Zero beats uh, Axel, and we get this line. I always liked you. Zero has so little character that I'm now saying he left the AOD after confessing his love to Axel, and he was rejected because Axel was married with kids. 
I have uh, to go with this because if I don't, Zero has nothing to make him interesting in the slightest. Anyway, after an admittedly cool fight scene on a couple mongooses, we learn that East and FaZe are one person, with East being a clone of FaZe, and Tucker gets stabbed. Carolina! It's, it's Tucker! He's dead. Oh no, Tucker's dead. When this episode first came out, I called BS along with 100% of the people watching, and the next episode, Tucker wakes up. Oh wow, Washington's alive now too! Also, Tucker sounds more like himself. I guess they found more money in the budget for Jason. And Tucker is written like Tucker. So, uh, what happened in the last episode? Also, Tucker says that Carolina won't understand why his sword is important because she never had one. Oh, come on. Aren't you gonna say it? No, because I'm pissed off! So, East is gone now that everyone knows she's evil. Raymond reveals that he knew she was a fake, and one tries to bring them together. Wes is having a hard time knowing his daughter betrayed them. He doesn't want to hurt her. And Shadow Squad tells him that to tell them what happened. We learn about his past as part of a group much like the Freelancers. They tried to make a new team and Zero was the strongest. When their war ended, Zero felt betrayed and kidnapped FaZe. She was born with defects and was experimented on, uh, giving her powers of teleportation, a hollow echo as they call it, and super speed. I would like to ask how these uh, points connect. Logically speaking, Zero should know about FaZe, but there's no scale to the timeline, and because of this, it's easy to miss what should be important character traits, like how Axel is one's adopted father, or how Zero knows about FaZe's abilities. Did she get them when she was a teen? A young child? Maybe she's had her powers for an entire week. The show drops exposition in the worst ways possible. They either tell us things that need to be shown, or they spend so little time explaining what they can't show that it becomes information easily discarded. Anyway, Zero sends his location to Shadow Squad and challenges them to a fight. And they act like they've had a long back and forth relationship like the Reds and Blues did with Felix and Locus. Unlike them, however, they're still building Zero's character. Nothing has happened yet and they're acting like it's the end of a big multi-arc story. This would be like if Red vs. Blue started with their first episode with You Ever Wonder Why We're Here and ended the episode with Epsilon dismantling himself to give the Reds and Blues enough of a fighting chance to maybe win in a war. If it's not built up properly, it doesn't mean jack. Speaking of... He's beaten us every single time. He's right. We've already lost too much. Look at you all. Don't you get it? This is what Zero does. He manipulates. He once asked me why I'm here, and I figured something out. I know why I'm here. I'm going to stop Zero. Yeah, the team is broken. Down their second best member after Carolina, and one gives them a speech about why they're here. The come together motivational speech does not work. They haven't done anything to warrant one. Nothing has happened this season. It's been what, three, four days at most? We don't know these characters. So when they're broken six episodes in, it means nothing. And you can do one of these speeches with characters we don't know. Red vs. Blue already did it. The last season of the Course Trilogy sees the opposing sides of the, the Civil War come together to face off against Felix, Locus, and their employer, General Hargrove. Alongside a small army of prisoners, the two marks freed earlier in the season. Now, we only got to know a small handful of soldiers on both sides and the two factions' leaders. We also got to see them all come together and how dysfunctional the sides were when they were working together. No one trusted each other, which caused them to lose ground constantly until Felix managed to get a second key that was tied to Doyle, the current leader of the government faction. Doyle sacrificed himself for the planet and everyone on both sides of the Civil War, leaving only the rebel leader. They also lost their capital city and the only base they had to protect themselves from Felix and Locus. It's here when they give their motivational speech after nuking a town, leaving thousands homeless, and killing off one of the best written side characters of the trilogy in a noble sacrifice. Chorus gave way to everything, which led to a very satisfying speech to bring two warring sides together to fight a common enemy. Zero has given us a loosely strung together plot points in hopes that we will be invested in characters so bland you'd be forgiven if you mistook them for a stale slice of bread. So now we come to the two part finale. The Storm Temple Zero is trying to take and split into three groups. Carolina takes the first fight against Diesel, Wes takes on both versions of his daughter, and the rest go out to Zero. Carolina's fight is the best looking one, but Carolina is always fun in a fight. Her motivations are simple, just revenge uh, that's underdeveloped. Before West battle, we get an interaction with Phase and One that comes almost out of nowhere. They don't get along in the series, but outside of the first episode where E starts shooting at One, and the second episode where they have somewhat of a conflict, 
Her line of always wanting reason to kill one feels honestly like they wrote the ending first and didn't know how to get there. They try to have some form of resolution for one's character arc that doesn't exist in season. One was the person who was supposed to have problems working together, but East was the one that didn't work well with others, leaving one to not really have a character arc in the story. Anyway, Faze tries to kill one and is stopped by her father, and they actually have a well done fight uh, and a good resolution to their storyline. It's not perfect and could use another draft, but the way the dynamic between the East slash Phase and West is built up works quite well. There's enough to be at least a little invested and has a decent payoff as uh, the one time they fight they also manage to talk it out. West spends the battle fighting both forms of Phase while only guarding. Phase questions why he essentially failed her and, uh, ta and she takes out her anger while he tells her why he gave her up. The reason why wasn't right, but he is willing to admit his failings and is willing to let her kill him if it will bring her peace. In truth, if their arc was the main focus of the season and the writing was just a little bit better, I wouldn't be making this video. Finally, one squad finds Zero and he's opening the temple. Zero beats him easily and obtains the ultimate power. He meets this generic looking alien thing called Black Lotus, gets tested, and his armor is upgraded. He becomes gold and gets a unicorn horn. We also finally learn why he's doing this. He wants to change things. That's it. FaZe and Carolina win their fights. FaZe decides not to kill her father and decides to help stop Zero for reasons not explained. In a better written show, it would be because of an epiphany about her father's love. Here she just swaps sides because. Also, Raymond releases the limiters on their suits, they have more power now, and Carolina comes to help. They all defeat Zero, who's judged to be unworthy, and is teleported away. Also, Shadow Squad goes to watch a movie. That's Red vs. Blue Zero, a spin-off that was rushed, underdeveloped, and poorly written. Good animation, some fun fights, but mostly a boring show that was severely in need of a rewrite. Now, because this video is way longer than I thought it was going to be, let's quickly run through what I think would make this series better. First off, get rid of Wash. He's not needed and a generic soldier could fulfill his role. Second, get rid of the training sequence in the second episode and have the parallels between the two teams' fighting style be during their first fight against each other. Half Shadow Squad barely make it out to, and did not have Zero just to walk away. Third, have East be the reason why they failed in their fight against the Viper Squad due to her glitch and make East far more impulsive in using her speed. Fourth, after failing their first mission, have Axel explain what he knows about Zero. And fifth, when uh, East glitches, uh, give us the flashes of what Zero, Phase, and Diesel are doing. It should be imperative that East doesn't know what the visions are or what they mean. Six, have East and West actually communicate. Still be distant, but slowly grow together so she doesn't hate him as much. Faze not being able to speak to him has her hatred of her father grow every time she sees him. Seventh, after the fight where Shadow Squad loses and before they go find Tucker, East reveals her visions to one and tells her she's afraid of what they mean, have her question the truth about who she is and losing herself to this more violent side. Make the glitches pop up more often as the series goes on, culminating in East essentially dying when she stabs Tucker. Eighth, and most importantly, let Tucker do things. Let him fight and let him fail. If he gets beat and barely makes it to the evac point, it'll feel far more earned and to take off less people. Then kill Tucker off. If the sword must be passed on to a new character, then at least have the balls to kill off Tucker. Beyond that, just expand on the characters. Tell and show us more about them. Now, I don't like Zero, but I want you to know how I went into Zero at the end of Season 17. They essentially wrote off Washington, having him sacrifice himself to save everyone. At the time, the writing was on the wall. It was becoming harder for people working on the show to continuously one-up themselves. And with the time travel seasons, they essentially jumped the shark. Now, at the time, I would have gladly taken one more trilogy, get the Reds and Blues up to 20 seasons, and retire the cast at that time. But between season 17 and 18, there was an exodus of cast members, and that became impossible without replacing voice actors. And if the death battle was anything to go by, that wasn't an option. But not long after season 17 wrapped up, they announced Red vs. Blue Zero, a new cast of characters with a new story. I was excited. The series needed a breath of fresh air, and we just went over how that went. I went in optimistic, and I was severely disappointed. There is good in Zero, and there are people who liked it a lot. And I'm glad for those people. But I have a saying, one I primarily use for games and media like Kingdom Hearts. Red vs. Blue Zero is a roller coaster. Either you're on or you're off. Zero was so bad for me that I'm getting off the coaster, and I doubt I'll be back anytime soon.